April the 18th is when um, we got report that Freddie Gray passed away, right, from his injuries. I was home with my wife. I think I was, might have still, it was later in the evening. I think I was in bed, got the news. Um, literally, my heart just felt like it broke. My wife, we got out of bed, we prayed together. And I told her as soon as I get back to work the next day, which was Monday, um, I had to get over to West Baltimore because I knew my family, I'm talking about the community, I knew they were hurt and I knew they were angry and bitter and a whole bunch of things. We just wanted to go over. I don't know what I could do, but I'm going to have to help try to restore some peace because I, I knew everybody was upset. So um, before I go any further, well, let me, just, let me finish this piece. So, so I get over here and uh, I drive past, I kind of loop around, and there's a sea of people out in front of the district, okay? By then, we had barricades up, Pastor help me, but I believe we have barricades right in the street, right? The first one, the first demonstration, no barricades. Was, oh, no, that's right, it was just fake. Matter of fact, fact, they came up. That's right, you're right. And you're they right. took over this. You're right, you're absolutely right. You're this absolutely platform. Right. I'm going to introduce him in a second. Mm -hmm. um, he's absolutely right. So the first day, we didn't have barricades. These jersey walls behind you, those are some of the barricades that are still there. Um, probably keep them there because we still have to get through trials and we don't know what, what's going to happen. And so anyway, um, when I come out, I, I parked on the back lot, came through the district. This is the Western District. Um, most of the districts look like this. This is, when, this is the original Western District, or at least goes back to, it was built back around 1960, this is the year I was born. Very outdated, very dilapidated and everything else. And, and, and so it's just, we ain't got time to go in, but it's just grungy, right? Yeah. So we have to, there's, there's something now in plans to rebuild districts to get rid of these things and, and, and give something. You know, when you come into a dirty place in a tour place that does something to your psyche and now you gotta go out to the community. You know, when you go into your workplace. But anyway, so I come through and when I come through, all I hear is chanting and hatred. You know, murderers, police. I don't know, well I do know what overcame me. So I came out, guys, are, my police are everywhere, hundreds of people in the street. I walked down the steps. All that was out here was a yellow tape. I lift up the tape and I walked out. You had every, news outlet from around the world here. And I just walked out, I was just led to walk out. As I walked down the steps and into the crowd, it took a few seconds for everybody to realize, hey guys, it took hey, a few seconds for everybody to realize that I was walking amidst the crowd. And then by the time I got probably directly in front of this in the middle of the street, I was sworn. Some of you might have saw that on um, um, CNN. <laughs> they did coverage on it and then I just got blasted. What are you doing out here? Blah, blah, blah. Long story short, um, there was a lot of hatred spew. I became the object of their affection, okay? Which was fine, I understood that. Because nobody else was addressing them at all, right? So, um, media, somebody talks about, somebody talked about media earlier and how media depicts. So media portrayed it as being hatred and the police is yelling at the community, community yelling at the police, and nothing could have been further than the truth other than they were yelling at me and cursing me out, right? Um, I left, I thought I was out there two, three minutes, I was actually out there about 20 minutes, had no idea. No idea. My guys came in, made a hole, grabbed me, pulled me out. I guess as soon as I got back up here, I get a call from headquarters. Colonel, what are you doing? It went viral. I said, what are you talking about? What are you doing hollering at the community? And the community's hollering at you. I said, first of all, you're not out here. Secondly, ain't nobody hollering. I literally hung up the phone. Because I don't have time to talk to people sitting in the perch in a white tower when we got a real situation. Does that make sense? Right. That's right. right. And so, finally, the same individual that was yelling murderers, the same individual like we hate you, literally came over. Police tried to stop someone and said, no, let them come over. We literally were talking. You may see a snap. If you Google, you may see me like this with my hat on, right? I'm literally talking to them and they're apologizing. They're saying, listen, uh, we didn't mean to direct that towards you, but you were the only one that was brave enough to come out and talk to us. Hmm. We love you, Colonel. And of course, we have more people. So we had a great dialogue. We started embracing, started hugging. Guess what happened with the media? They, 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 they stood right here with us, but they put their pads away. <laughs> they shut the cameras down. And for an hour, we had a love fest. And not one reporter reported on it. Wow. Okay? This happened every day um, during the uprising. They came to this location. When I got that phone call, I, I got chastised and said, you don't go back out there ever again. Hmm. So I was locked down on Tuesday. Tuesday, they was out here again, and they chanted, where's Officer Melvin? We want Officer Melvin. They started jumping the barricade, and some things started happening. They actually locked up a few um, protesters. I get a call that night, Tuesday night. Where are you at? 
I'm on lockdown where you told me to be on lockdown. I'm in, I'm in headquarters in a stinking perch when I want to be out with my people. You need to get back out there. So we came back out, and I don't have time to tell you, but we came back out the next day. Because um, I told him, make up your mind. You want me inside, you want me outside. Came back out the next day, and um, there's another thing you might see on video where someone throwing bottles at the police, and you might see me. I arrested somebody. Anyway, um, this is a pastor from this community. A great pastor, a lot of street credibility. The guys talk to him in the street. The guys love him. He's beloved by the community. This is Pastor Harris. He's affectionately known as CW. Is that all right? That's it. Okay. And so Pastor Harris has been helping create the peace, bring back the peace. He's one of my great allies over here. This area probably has about 29 churches, and I can count on one hand how many pastors want to get engaged. Mm. I can count on one hand how many pastors, even during that time, got engaged. There should have been no reason I had to call across the city to get 100 pastors when I got them pretty much in close proximity. Hmm. That make sense? That's right. But they would not come out because they were afraid. They were afraid. Any questions? Because we got to get in the vans and we got to move. Any questions? All right, so let's get to the next spot. Let's get in the vans. We're going right to our next um, spot location. And um, I think you'll find this one interesting. Thank you guys for what you do, man. All right, so listen, and pastor's going to correct me if I'm wrong. First, I'm going to make him repeat something. He keeps talking in my van, y'all, and I'm not having this right here. Because <laughs> he's only giving, he's only talking to one-third of it. And I told him, hush up, man. Come on, wait till you. I see. Anyway, so this is Gilmore Homes across the street. Pastor's going to explain, give you a little bit of history about Gilmore. I'm sorry, about Winchester, Sandtown, Winchester. So basically what I want you to do is just regurgitate real quick. 72 square blocks. Gilmore Homes take up a third of our community. In 1990, there were 52 churches in the 72 square block area. And with those dynamics, if you know the scripture, one chase a thousand, two put 10,000 to flight. There shouldn't be any poverty in this community with those mathematics. To date, we have 33 church in the 72 square block area. Okay, so, so almost 20 churches have closed down left, right? And then out of that 32 that's left, you already heard me tell you, to tell you, you, are, you heard me allude to how many are disengaged, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was behind us was one of the very first murals, if not the first. The first. Yeah, this is the first mural mm -hmm. that went up almost overnight, wow. almost wow. overnight for Freddie Gray, all right? Um, what I want you to do is follow me real quick, real quick, walk over here. All right, so for the, the video that went around the world, this is the actual location that you saw over and over again where Freddie Gray was first approached and arrested. This is the actual location. This is um, city property because it is public housing. Um, this mural, I think went up second or third. Second. Second. So this was the second one that went up. Um, in talking to housing initially, they were going to take it down right away because it's, you know what it is. But they, uh, thank God they called me and, and I said, if you take that down, you're going to start another ride. Right? So let's leave it alone, at least for now. Um, let it sit up there. Um, they didn't, no one had permission to paint on that building, that city property, not city property, well, that's private property. And obviously this is city property. And so literally, they wanted to take it down as soon as it went up. And we advised them, I had to sit down with um, housing, the manager here, and their, their um, director, and said, please don't do that right now because again, you're really gonna set something off, right? People are still mourning, people are still hurting. You gotta realize the magnitude of this. And so you still see some of the um, few of the items that have been left. They're not gonna go anywhere from it right now. Um, Someone asked a question earlier, did Freddie Gray live in these public housing? He actually did not. He actually lived in a private home not too far from here. Um, his mom lives on the other side of town. But this is a place that I think he grew up here. He grew up here. So one of the cultures that we have here, especially coming out of public housing, if you grew up here and your formal years were here, you're coming back every day.
you're coming back every day. Whether or not you're just hanging out with the guys, whether you want to be involved in drug trade. And let me just say this, Freddie was a, a former drug dealer. He was not a drug dealer at the time that he was arrested. As a matter of fact, he was a very poor, low-level drug dealer. Very poor, low-level drug dealer. Every time he sold drugs, just about he got locked up. Good drug dealers don't get locked up, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so, and again, he was a nickel and dime guy. Mm -hmm. um, he had a lot of positive with him at the same time. You know, good and evil. That thing, good and evil, was fighting you and battling you. So, but this is the location. Any questions? No questions. All right. What I want to do is we're gonna get back in advance, but I want to walk you through so you can get a sense of the community. We're gonna walk through Gilmore, cut through the break over here, and it's just a little piece of it. Come back up Mount Street, which is the street right here where our vans are parked. We're going to walk through. Okay? And don't be afraid to say hello to people. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey guys, real quick. This is, um, and you probably saw him. No, no, don't film. Don't, don't pull your um, Open the back, footballs, baseball, it converts into a basketball, and we get the officers. And unfortunately, all I could do was get my community officers to play with the kids. The patrol officers didn't want nothing to do with it as much as I would tell them to come through. Eventually they warmed up, but for weeks and weeks, if not a couple of months afterwards, we couldn't get the patrol officers to come out and engage the community. We set it up over there quite often. We set it up in the middle of the street. Um, my guys out of their own pockets would run to the corner stores, get as many bags of chips and ice cream to just feed the kids. So it was a great look, but um, the real thing we wanted to do is get the patrolmen that worked this area to get engaged, and that was very difficult. That's still a healing process that's going on. All right, guys, listen up. We're running behind. Let me have your attention. So this was the CVS that you saw on TV being looted, being burned. This is the infamous Penn and North, Pennsylvania and North Avenue. Major thoroughfare for our city. I actually took pictures of the inside. I thought it was going to be salvageable. Talked to the construction workers and it said it's beyond repair. It was really beyond marred, beyond charred. It was very destroyed. But CVS company, as well as the Rite Aid Pharmacy, they have determined that we're going back into the community. So they're rebuilding it from scratch. They're rebuilding it from scratch. All right, so this is where, this was the epic center for everything, for all the rioting, for all the, uh, the protests every night. This is where they were shut down the street. This is where you saw the riot gear. This is where the curfew was. In the middle of the street, you saw, if you was watching the news, you saw them saying, go home, the helicopter flying overhead. It's 10 o'clock, go home, don't be arrested, go home. This is where it was. Um, straight up Pennsylvania Avenue, we're not going up there, but probably about a half a mile up is Mondarmi Mall. Mondarmi Mall was where it all kicked off at, where you start seeing young people throwing rocks at the police officers and bottles. It's where the mass of people got injured. Over 160 officers got injured. Um, and they made their way coming down Pennsylvania Avenue, destroyed a police car about three blocks up. And then finally just took this corner, went down and just started looting. You probably saw um, a police, it was actually not one of ours, but an um, MTA transit um, police officer car totally got torched. Some of you might have seen a fire hose. The fire department tried to put out the fire hose. Somebody came up behind the hose, stabbed the fire hose. That was right here. So this is the Epic Center. Um, the day that the six officers got indicted, this became almost like a parade area where they were coming through, taunting the police, cheering, and everything else. So this is the Epic Center. Okay? Any questions? Y'all good? Yeah. Look a little different than on TV? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So we're going to make our way back. We're going to make our way back, and then we're going to um, get to our final stop. Let's go this way. Hey, 
Hey, so listen, family, we've had an extraordinary night. You know, we're in the middle of the DOJ, OJJ, DP, and we had an extraordinary night. So what we did is we took pastors from around the country, and we took them on a walking tour of Sandtown, Winchester area, where the uprising birthed out of Freddie Gray. And so you guys know the story. So here's the thing, after we did the walking tour, we went to one of the most active churches in the Sandtown community called New Song. And the, these pastors that we brought in got to sit down with the senior pastor and some of the pastors at that church. And what we decided to do was have a panel discussion with some of the guys from the neighborhood whose voices have never been heard. Right? So all that stuff you saw on the world news, local news, I don't care where you are in the country and in the world, that stuff that you saw, you were hearing from people that weren't from those communities. Right? You were even hearing from people that would might have been from Baltimore and were from Baltimore, but they were not from Sandtown. And one of the main complaints I got from Sandtown Winchester is, Colonel. Our voice has been stolen, it's been silenced, no one has ever heard from us. So literally, this was the first group tonight that got a chance, that I know of, got a chance to sit before an audience to hear their voice. So you had some young men from the community, you had pastors from the community, they came raw. Matter of fact, they probably won't edit this because it was real raw, but it was the truth. They talked to the truth of not only why the uprising, but what's not happening now and what needs to happen. So listen, I, listen. It's been a magical night. I hope these guys enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the video because I know it's coming out now. I'm sorry, they're messing with me. <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, guys, look, we love you. Um, love um, DOJ for everything they're doing, the leadership mm -hmm. here. We're going to listen, we're going to lift America and it's going to come out of Baltimore. For All us. right. God bless you. Thank you.